So we are, let me move this to the side here. Thanks everybody for joining. My name is Mike Raftery and I'm a partner here at SCM Connections. And today's uh, session is the second one in a four part series that we're doing with our friends at SAP on migrating from APO to IVP. Um, why is it four parts? Because there's a lot of stuff to cover. And I would say this one is probably the most content heavy of all of them. Um, it sort of takes the infamous s &P functionality and it helps you map it to where uh, where it goes on the IBP platform. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot uh, in that in that concept. So um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. This is a 90 minute session. It will be recorded. It will be shared. You will get an email with links to all of it to share with your friends and loved ones. Um, but for questions and answers, please use the question feature in the GoToMeeting app. That would be very much appreciated. The um, uh, and then we'll go ahead and read them out, and it works really well from just a chat point of view, and to keep a rolling uh, rolling log for those in the past, or when you get it later, you can get them also. Um, and feel free to ask along the way, and I'll use that chat feature to bring up those questions when we can. So that's it. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for today's session, like I said, this is the second of four. We're going to send out the links to the previous sessions on um, follow-up email as well, which is on demand planning migration and the overview of the IBP platform. Today, after we go through our introductions, we're going to go through just the comparison of the two platforms. Um, Eric Simonson from SAP is going to go into some detail on that. It's always a topic that has a lot of engagement, so we're looking forward to that uh, walkthrough. Then Patrick Green and myself will walk through some of the IBP planning functions, both in time series and in order series. And then I'll help you get an understanding of, of sort of what the two do, when to use them, um, and sort of the different feature sets within the IBP environment. And then finally, some project considerations and best practices. So it's one thing to understand where it's going. It's another thing to understand the platform, but how do you actually make it work for you? And that's what we're going to do in the project considerations today. So with that, this is um, this is us. This is who we are. Um, Eric, do you want to give a quick little background of your um, just yourself and your role at SAP, so people who haven't met you know it, where you come from? Sure. Yeah. So that way you get the the story behind the face on the screen. Um, so Eric Simonson, been with SAP 22 years. I started as one of the first 10 consultants on the East Coast back in the days of APO. So I've been through the war, so to speak, of implementations. I was also on the demo slash pre-sales team for a while. And then I was the product owner for PPDS uh, up until the advent of the release of IBP back in 2014. So since then, I have focused my energies on the response and supply side. And I appreciate you, Mike, saying that this is the meatiest of the subjects. I feel that way every day. Um, some people have it easier, but we, uh, we on the supply side are the ones that make it happen, right? So Yes. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that was on the demand one, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Pat, do you want to give a quick intro on yourself? Yeah, my name is Pat Green. I have a uh, partner here at SCM Connections. I've been doing uh, in the APO space, in, well, sorry, in the SAP uh, planning space for about 20-some years. Uh, started, got my feet wet with uh, PPDS about 2001-ish. Uh, or so, and have moved through all the, the modules within APO and then moved into IBP about five or six years ago. Um, focus on supply, so that kind of tends to be my, my area of focus, although I dabble in PPDS um, quite significantly as well as the man. So, uh, looking forward to the session. Cool. Thanks. And myself, um, Mike Rafter, as I said, another partner here at SAM Connections, uh, just like Pat, been doing APO and IBP for about 20 years implementing um, both on the client side, now as a consultant side, but that same connections have a lot of experience on both of those and focus a lot on the supply, specifically S&P. So why are we here? Why is this even a topic? What's behind Eric's comment on this being the meatiest one? Um, first of all, I think it's just the landscape is changing. Um, the business needs have changed and project considerations have changed dramatically since APO was introduced 21 years ago, 22 years ago, something like that. And because there's an extended focus on um, scenario planning and, and turns in a supply chain planning process flow, um, SAP has deployed a cloud-based platform in IVP, which allows for a lot more flexibility, a lot more responsiveness in that planning environment. And with that, 
um, comes a different sort of landscape from the planning point of view. What used to be sort of self-contained, tied at the hip with ECC, now has a lot more flexibility because it's not as closely integrated. And we'll go into a lot of detail around what that means here in the in the um, in the next few slides. Uh, starting with some of the transformation strategies this is probably the, the best. Whoops, the best one to start with. Um, Eric, this slide is, is, I'm sure, ingrained in your brain and, and shows up in your dreams every night. But do you want to kind of walk through sort of where this one box and why there's so many other boxes that it sort of splits out into um, in the future state? Yeah, sure. You're, and you're right. I think if I had to get a tattoo, I'd get this tattooed on me. Um, um, look we talk, right on here. <laughs> we, talk, we talk about it so often, right? Even just a quick story going back to ASUG and Sapphire of 2015 is when we had the first roundtable that I know you guys attended and a couple others may had about 15 or 20 people about the APO migration or APO, where does it go or something like this. And then you guys actually held a session two years later on your own that I partook in kind of as in the back standing by a wall, but got sucked into it, of course, as we start talking about SMP. And this has been a big topic of conversation, of course, for our entire stall base about how do we move or transform. So key takeaway here is if we start in the middle, you see two pieces of functionality, demand, which you already covered, and then SNP functionally moving to IBP on the left side, and they were built from scratch, right? Um, and then on the right side of the box in black, PPDS and GATP have functionally moved to S4 HANA. Um, also built from scratch was new AATP. PPDS is basically a lift and shift from a code perspective. There are other things that came from an infrastructure standpoint back in the 2016 timeframe. And there's actually new functionality that's come out this year and other stuff on a roadmap for PPDS that you'll cover on that topic. Uh, we're gonna focus our energies on SMP today, but just the takeaway for this slide is to understand where half of the functionality went from a, a, a transformation perspective to IBP and half of it went to S4 HANA. So when we look here at SMP, Mike has highlighted this, both sales and operations planning and response and supply. And the reason he's done this is because we see it kind of twofold. We see it both from a tactical perspective, which is mid to long-term planning, or even tying in from a strategic planning perspective to the SNOP planning process. We see a lot of customers doing that. And then we'll get into more detail around response and supply, which is more equivalent to the order-based SMP functionality where we're doing planned orders, stock transfers, we have a deployment runs, and then you'll see on the roadmap here some load consolidation coming, which is the, um, the next generation for TLB and others, okay? So the key takeaway of this slide is functionally we've moved the SMP both from a tactical and operational perspective into IBP. All right, just real quickly here, hopefully everyone's aware, IBP is a platform, uh, is comprised of demand, which you covered, inventory optimization, which came from a rewrite from the acquisition of Smart Ops in 2013. Sales and operations planning is kind of the genesis of where all this started. Um, response to supply, what we're here to talk about today. SAP control tower, which is kind of the ring around it, the way I like to think about it is the roof. And then DDR, demand-driven replenishment, story for another day, but that's a unique way to do replenishment based upon pull methodology uh, in the demand-driven institute. We have it both from an IBP perspective as an S and an S4 perspective as well. A couple other things here as we talk about how we tie into different applications. Uh, the Ariba Business Network used to be called SAP Supply Chain Collaboration, as you see here on the screen is how we can connect to suppliers, right? We have native built integration from IBP to there. We call it the forecast commit process where we can hand a wish list of our demands. Maybe we could run an unconstrained supply plan uh, and say, this is what we want vendors. And then they can come back to us and say, well, I know you wanted 10,000 in this period, but you're only gonna get 8,000. And next period, I'll give you the extra 2,000. And we can use that input from them as a constraint in our planning process, or we can say, you know what, how can we get the other 2,000 from a different supplier? So we have connectivity to that Ariba for direct materials. And then at the bottom, of course, with S4 HANA, and just as a quick note, we of course still do connect to SAP ECC. Uh, many of our customers that I work with on a regular basis uh, are 
on ECC and they're in their process of um, migrating or implementing S4 HANA in their journey, okay? But key takeaway here is that we can connect into this from a production planning perspective, regular good old PP or PPPI, uh, also ePPDS, which we call synchronized planning, which I'll talk about later, and then available to promise the regular flavor of ATP as well as advanced ATP, um, we'd have some connection points with them too. So I always kind of like to think as planning in general is kind of the glue that holds everything else together. And I'll end on this note, on this slide. When we were doing our last Sapphire in person, uh, we had, for any of you that were there, maybe you remember we were at the far end of the auditorium and we did this thing called design to operate, which started with PLM, right? All the way to internet of things and operation. And actually they physically didn't know where to put, they did it sequentially and they didn't know where to put the planning section right we had two pods for the planning section and first they put us at the beginning and actually the night before the the conference started they switched us to second right but truth be known we could be anywhere in that process because planning is continuously happening and i know that we all know that but i i, I always think of us as the glue that kind of keeps the supply chain um scm perspective in general together yeah. one quick thing just to point out about this graphic too eric because it, it's kind of referenced on the right but not not quite so much as I like how there's a graphic in the middle where all of this planning activity centers around one version of the truth. And when you talk about, well, that's great, you know, you have demand, you have response and supply, you've got all these disparate pieces. You know, it's my opinion that what really shapes um, as IBP as a industry leader is the fact that it's all in one uh, database, in one planning area. So this end-to-end -end visibility to have your demand and your um, supplier, your vendor availability, your cost data, your financial data all in one spot allows you to just move through these little wedges so much faster than you ever could have uh, with different systems or if data is in different spots. So I think, um, you know, all those elements are great, but the combined um, solution offered by an all existing in one planning area is something that um, is hard to really wrap your mind around until you see it in practice. Yeah, you know, it's a good it's a good point. Sometimes I forget because uh, I live it every day that these are not different systems or they're broken up from a commercialization standpoint. And we did that on purpose, just like we did in the old days of APO, because different times a lot of customers want to consume them separately, right? So they maybe want to start with SNOP or they want to start with SNOP and demand, then work to the supply side, etc. So th this is a decision that we did from a commercialization and go to market. But you're right, Mike, it is all one system and sits on the HANA database in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just to kind of add on to that is that, you know, it provides a lot of unlocks as you're kind of working through your demand, tracing things through, getting your customers instead of having the demand DP, demand planning, and S&P kind of being two separate systems, if you will, you can get all of that within the same system, within the same planning area, within IBP. And so as you're starting to look through and prioritize uh, demand signals, et cetera, and use the optimizer, et cetera, um, you know, a lot, you, it unlocks a lot of functionality, um, which is, you know, for us is a big thing than for our customers. Okay, so let's just talk quickly about the kind of the unified user experience. Uh, again, I was there at the start of APO. We, again, I worked on the consulting side and the pre-sale side. I can tell you even when I switched over to the pre-sale side, um, we never really won the beauty contest, quite honestly. I mean, SAP GUI was great. If you knew it well and you spent a lot of time investing in it, like we did as consultants and, and some of our install base and our planners, but casual users or somebody that just, you know, a planning system is only a portion of their job. It, it was it was hard to get. It was very detailed and intricate, but and it was powerful. But you had to be well versed in it. We've, we kind of took that to heart in the whole move to the cloud from a company perspective. So we have a lot of dashboardings, as you can see here, web-based dashboard in the top left corner, and we also have Excel as a front end. Now it is not Excel offline Excel as some of our customers did when we talk about moving from a planning system, which was an off offline Excel spreadsheets. It truly is just a front end. It's a new GUI. And when you hit the save button, it's committing to the HANA database behind the scenes, right? For whatever version that you're in. So just know that we've taken this to heart in terms of ease of use from a, from a planner perspective. And actually we have a new thing that came out uh, called the planner's workspace. 
um, which actually is great. It's kind of combining uh, different views into one screen so planners can see everything together instead of having to go to different dashboards or different front ends. So this is something that was just released in the, uh, in the last release and has gotten great reviews so far. All right, if you wanna go to the next slide, Mike. Okay, so that's kind of just the level setting in terms of what IBP is. Hopefully most know about that, but if not, let's now jump into response and supply. So we cover different topics under the response and supply umbrella, both from a process perspective and a functional capability perspective. So first, if we look on the left-hand side here, um, for those of you familiar with APO or even MRP, we have an unconstrained supply heuristic. So it's basically the MRP run will tell you through, through lead times and multiple bill level bill material, this is how much I need, this is what I need it on, but it's not constraining against the capacity. It will tell you when there's capacity problems, both from a material or a resource perspective. Then when you look here, we now have a cost-based optimization. So again, we had this before. It's the same kind of logic and engine behind the scenes. We do have a couple new pieces of functionality that uh, Mike will touch on later, so I won't steal his thunder. Um, and we also have, if you look on the right-hand side here, response management. This is kind of the new part of response and supply. We are using a prioritization-based algorithm, which is very similar to what we had in the days of CTM. Um, a little bit different from how you can set up the priorities. It's more multi-dimensional instead of just a flat list, I would say. But there are two key words in this bullet point on the right that I want you to, to take away from this slide. And that is we can determine the allocations. So we do allocation creation, okay? And allocation meaning the SAP lingo, which is a cap in a certain period of time for a certain characteristic combination that someone can't order more than. So allocations are used as part of the order of fulfillment process, right, ATP. And you say you're capped at 1,000, so someone puts in an order for 1,100, they're not allowed to have the other 100, it flips over to the next bucket. So before that allocation process was more kind of, I took a forecast, I'd tribal knowledge, I'd monkey with the numbers, plus or minus a little bit. Um, but key takeaway here is we can do this as part of a planning run now in response and supply using the model as a constraint. Okay, that's the first big unique difference. Second is the next word in that bullet point, which is order confirmations. And what we mean by that, I, I should have written sales order confirmations. I'll have to update the slide. So we can take a sales order, um, and if you're not using ATP in this perspective, run a supply plan and do a sales order confirmation at the same time. So put in old terminologies, it's like running a CTM run with BOP together. All right. Before we would do it as a two-step process, and we can still do that today. And some customers like that; they need online sales order promising, and then they'd want to do, you know, a, a new backorder processing, whether it be through rules and logic or through interactive backorder processing. That's still fine, and it's still supported as part of the ATP. Um, but inside of Response and Supply, we built a new thing, and that is a supply run can change a demand element. So this is different. Right? We never had that before. Demands were always cast in stone, whether it was a forecast, whether it was a safety stock, or whether it was a sales order. And now today with our confirmation run, we can change the material availability date. We won't change the material request date, but so if it's requested on the 15th, and for whatever reason we can't deliver it full on the 15th, whether it's an allocation, whether it's a lead time, whether it's a capacity issue, a material shortage in the bomb, whatever. Key takeaway is if we reschedule that order on the 17th, we're gonna be able to know that, right? We'll see that it's late, but we can change the material availability date and that new date goes back on the sales order to ERP, okay? This is very important. Then finally, deployment planning process, just like before, we have a heuristics-based pool and we have an optimization-based um, deployment that uses ATD available to deploy. Um, again, I don't want to steal Mike's thunder here. There's some fair share distribution at the bottom, uh, which we'll talk about. We have this uh, both from a tactical and operational supply planning perspective. Uh, but I will mention one thing here, the alerting and the root cause analysis. So custom alerts are part of control tower. We do have regular alerting. But the root cause analysis, we call a gating factor inside of response and supply, operational supply planning. And that's a full pegging that tells you why something was missed. Again, lead time, material constraint, capacity hit, et cetera. So when using the prioritization algorithm, we can see the reason why something is either not fulfilled quantity on time or it's late from a date time, or, uh, from a date perspective. So this is new. 
I know we didn't have a great analysis. I'd say this, and I say this truthfully as an SAP person, our front end, again, I mentioned the beauty contest in the old days, and then our analytics inside the planning tool were never the greatest either, right? So as a consultant, we'd have to extract that data to BW back in the old days or some other central reporting tool. Sometimes we do SMP remote cubes, but it would only report on the persistent data, right? So it wasn't perfect, but we had some workarounds from a consulting perspective. We really went in and built IBP with those two things in mind, meaning usability and analysis through dashboarding, through Fiori apps, and you'll see a lot of these Fiori apps on the response and supply side. Yeah, it's, I would say that it lives more there than it does on, definitely more than the supply time series side, but that response and um, allocation logic, it's also really easy to consume in those Fiori tablets, or sorry, in those Fiori tiles. Uh, it's color coded. You know, it, it, there's alerts that draw your eye. It, it's much more, um, again, everything is to help speed up those decision cycles. And it's been a huge um, advantage to those that use it to just boom, zero in right on the issue, identify it and, and look for root causes. And I think uh, Eric, to, to your point, there has been a lot of focus there and it shows. Yep. yep. Okay, there's a lot of words on this screen. I'm not gonna read all of them. This, you'll get the deck so you can go through it in detail later. I think the key takeaway here, I'm just gonna touch on them. As I already kind of mentioned, starting on the left-hand side there, we support both tactical and operational supply planning. I talked about what response management is, and that's a sales order reconfirmation. I mentioned allocation planning, that's the creation of them. All right, kind of already did talk about supplier constraints. This is how we can connect to Ariba or some other system that if you have supplier data coming in, it's just a key figure that we can populate that can then be used as a constraint. Um, we do of course have supply chain adjustments. You can do this both at a key figure level where then you can rerun the engine and it tries to meet those goals that you've put in or actually released interactive planning starting the end of last year and earlier this year where you can actually go in and fix or change specific orders too. I'm gonna come back to switchable constraints because I wanna end on that. Um, pegging I mentioned, so on the order base side, we have full pegging through the bill of material and through the network. So you can see a demand element all the way through the network. And if you have a multi-level bomb, all the way down to a purchase requisition that's meeting that finished good. Um, I talked about the gating factors and alerts already, but let's just touch briefly on switchable constraints. So this is important. I actually did a presentation internally um, uh, last week on this, and I mentioned it, and I got a few questions from colleagues internally. So right now, switchable constraints we have on the operational order base side for both algorithms, the priority algorithm and the optimizer. Um, and this is a way we enhanced it. We released it once, then we enhanced it in a further release that we can do it at a granular level by object. First, it was global. You turned them all on or all off. Now we can say we wanna turn on you know, resource constraints for these three resources, or we wanna turn them off, right? So this is, can be very powerful. And I think it's, it's kind of a best kept secret, if you will. We didn't like go to the mountaintops and scream about this, but I think it's really good. So if you run an unconstrained plan, or if, you're, or if you can run the wide open, you can see, okay, this would be my perfect scenario, what I want, oh, I'm way over capacity on these. Right, or you could turn on the, the constraints for those resources and see how it can offload it to other priorities, right? So really important here, we have this on the operational order side. It is planned for the roadmap next year um, on the time series optimizer. But I thought that's really important on the slide dimension. Yeah. And we have really. one more to second slide, I think. Yep. There we go. Okay, so optimization, cost maintenance, I won't go into the details, but we do have a way of setting it global. We have it setting kind of by rule, if you will. And then we do have it actually by time dependency, like in a key figure, so you can get very granular if you want. So there's different levels. Um, I, I mentioned deployment optimization. We actually have the ability to do a cost generation through that today. Most customers like to put the cost in themselves and do the pulleys and levers to, to make it do what they want. But we do have a cost generation based on some business rules. Um, and then we have the supply chain master data analysis as part of uh, the one of the gating factors that tells you some of the dependencies in the plannings to make sure your lanes and, and resources and, and PDSs, the bombs and routing are set up correctly for certain items. Of course, um, SAP has you know, simulation capabilities. I will say the comparison of these simulation capabilities and the ad hoc scenarios that come with it 
So we can do full version copies like we did historically, but we can also do these ad hoc scenarios, which are kind of the delta, right? They're intended to live for shorter periods of time and they can be shared through collaboration um, and it's very powerful and through Excel or through dashboards, you can do version or scenario comparisons very easily. Um, what used to take a lot of effort, <laughs> and as I mentioned before, in the days of APO, especially on the supply right. side, we can, right. we can do right there. <laughs> Yeah, it would take a long time. You'd have to burn down the planning version, rebuild it from scratch, and it was a lot. So as somebody implemented it, that what-if capability is just, a, you know, you see people's eyes light up <laughs> when they say you can just you can just update the demand signal or just update a couple of SKUs. So that is a good yeah. feature. And it's just literally one click in the planning view, and through Excel at least, to show, oh, I want to show these two or these three to compare against each other. And for those of us that were consultants, we knew how hard it was to get that data out to somewhere we could report on it in the old days. So, okay, I'm gonna end on this slide before I pass the baton to Mike. Um, I'll just say, if you take one thing away from, from uh, response and supply, know that we, can, that we can cover the tactical, what we have is a time series perspective, both an unconstrained heuristic, priority heuristic, or an optimization, scenario what is he's going to go through some of those details later and then the bottom two pieces again are still part of the uh, order based uh, data model or data store i just split them up here to show them because we actually do have three runs in the tool depending on what it is that you want to do whether it's generating those allocations whether it's reconfirmation of sales orders that you see in the third bullet point below or the deployment planning so in today's world we have those three runs um, actually, at the beginning of next year, we're going to actually consolidate those down to two. So there'll be a deployment and there'll be another regular run, so to speak, that allows you to turn on and off those other things instead of having to do it separately. So it'll be just one template moving forward. But it's good to understand this process. So we cover both tactical time series, longer range planning, as well as shorter term. I think one thing, you know, as we transition here into the details of these is to when you conceptualize why, you know, what are these things? Why is there different runs? What are you talking about here? Um, just a little history of it. SP, as it was developed, the supply network planning and APO was really, um, you know, we talked about it in our planning call, much more of like a production planning plus tool. Um, you could do some, some bucketed planning, you could do capacity leveling and even optimization, but at the end of the day, it still needed order level data and had order level rigor for whatever process that you um, that you ran, no matter what. And what we're gonna go through here in this next section is walking through, well, what happens, right? What if you didn't need that for everything? And so what we're doing now is gonna walk through the differences of time series supply planning. And when you think of time series, think of the lowest level is a time element. So it could be a day, it could be a week, month, quarter, year, but a time element is the lowest level you go. When you're talking about order level planning, you're really talking about orders being that lowest level. So now you're tied at the hip to your S4 or your ECC system and your order numbers sync up. And like Eric was saying, you can update those sales orders, you can, you can read real time data. So, so that's, sort of a trick that we use in our training and our, our um, onboarding is that when you hear time series, think that time is the lowest level in a bucket. There is no order. Order series mean it's something you can actually act on inside of your ERP tool. And that's kind of drives into this view here today. So if you look at this process flow, right, your order base is gonna be that response planning, your operational planning, I threw the horizon out, your mileage may vary, but it's short term, right? Your time series is gonna be that capacity planning. And, and why I drew this out is that in the past, S&P was doing all of this to some extent. I mean, there was deployment engines, but even that you could argue is S&P. But my point is that now you've got sort of two environments to do that. And when you go, go that far and you actually split them apart, like SAP has done with IVP, now you've got the ability to run a lot more flexibility, right? They're both more powerful. Your time series planning can do a lot more simulations. It can do a lot more what ifs. It can do a lot more, um, hype, you know, hypotheticals much faster because it's not um, a slave to that ERP system. 
your order-based planning no longer has to have a horizon of three years you know to get a plan out and you can have a really short-term order-based horizon turn things around quickly so those are the sort of advantages that you get in there and then when you talk about what that plan actually looks like right in your end-to-end -end supply plan you can see your IBP tactical supply planning feeds it. So you're looking at SNOP, rough cut planning, inventory projections, uh, resource utilization, network uh, facility planning, right? Transportation. Everything that feeds into that monthly planning cadence that allows your executives or your, you know, your directors to go ahead and, and actually change the plan and save costs or meet, make more customers happy. Your operational supply planning would take that strategy from the time bucket level, right? The blue is time, time series, which means you're at the bucket level. And then you start feeding all these other processes, right? You have your operational supply planning, stock transfer requests. This is much closer in nature, not exactly, but it's closer in nature to what the old S&P would do. That would feed into some of your PPDS production execution elements. And then from there, you go into your deployment which is also an order series plan. So when you think about them, it's important to understand um, you know, where these go to because every project is different. You can do a response and supply project focused solely on tactical supply planning. You don't have to go all the way to order level detail. Okay, conversely, you can just go straight to the order level planning data and not bother at all with your tactical bucketed planning. They're not one solution, right? They're, they're sort of two different elements to implement, and that's that's sort of a new concept for people. If you can think about what S&P used to do, it used to do all of this, and with the IBP solution, they kind of pulled that apart. So your tactical supply planning sits in a, in a planning area that is time series based, right? Where time is the lowest level of granularity. And then your operational supply planning and deployment sits in a separate planning area that is order level granularity. You don't need to have all of the forecasting engines. You don't need to have all of the what if plans for three, five years, capital budgeting, all of that, right? Your operational planning is, is focused on uh, issue identification and execution, uh, making the most out of the least of, of your components. So that's a good way to think of that process, sort of end to end. Got the next one here. There we go. So time series supply planning, again, it's going to run on constrained supply plans. It's going to maximize profit, right? It's going to look for penalty costs. This is your typical sort of constrained planning engine. Um, a finite planning run will, for example, Right, smooth your production quantities based on available capacity. So if you have a company or a product um, that has a seasonal demand spike, right, you can actually use this constrained planning engine to pull that forward and show some preloading of resources, which will allow you to plan, for example, overtime utilization, uh, labor scheduling, transportation management, in that you need to know if, if you need to contract um, carriers from one location to another. Uh, vendor coordination, how many components do we need to purchase for each location in a manufacturing scenario? When you have this sort of capacity management, this is where those strategic decisions go into play. So time series planning will allow you to do this. Um, you, with those constraints, you can turn them on and off. What would we get or what could we use if you know time and money were no object and you can start layering on constraints to pressure test your supply chain and understand the impacts of um of reality based on your customer demand and this is becoming a lot more critical right as people start having uh labor shortages as people start having raw material shortages your constraints now become more complex and uh, there's more of them so with this, you really um, leverage that time series to get ahead of it, right? Do we shut a plant down? Do we turn a line on? All of those sort of strategic decision-making can happen with this type of a tool. Now, the aggregate constraints is another element that I think is a huge advantage of time series planning in that now you don't need to evaluate or even run or even constrain your plan at the lowest level. And that's part of the advantage of not being so um, operationally focused in your time series planning. Your time series supply planning engine 
is now going to be responsible not just for running constraints at any level. So, for example, if you have, if you're going to make all of your, in this example, cherry flavors in one run, you want the the uh, mixing tank to be your minimum constraint. You can go ahead and do that, and then it it should layer those um, orders to consume that cherry tank, you know, across pack sizes and um, formats. I mean, that's sort of a, a specific example, but the fact that you can do that easily is sort of a unique um, uh, advantage, I would say, of, of getting out of the way of that operational planning. In S&P, you'd have to use aggregate planning, which if you remember, um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys did it in your consulting days, but I sure, sure did, and you had to rebuild all of your master data into basically what ended up being time series data. And so to have a, a planning area built for time series functionality is really an advantage for this um, aggregated planning constraints. Um, not only can you actually run it here, but just the ability to view it, right, allows you to look for problems and then, as I say, pull a thread to find the issues behind it. So if you're if you're over under capacity, over under delivering, over under inventory projections on a certain category of beverage, a uh, certain subfamily, you can go ahead and, and drill through those levels to understand the elements behind them and address any issues that may, may arise. The fair share distribution is another um, interesting mix to this, where you're now able to understand um, how to say it, prioritization within your supply chain. So this goes back to that slide. If you remember the slide where everybody is on a is in a circle and they're all looking at the same data element. This is another really large advantage to running your plan in IBP in that now your demand and your inventory and your capacity and your um, and your raw materials are all in one planning area. And when that happens. Right? When you're all in one database, now you don't lose any granularity. If you have a customer or a channel or a product portfolio that requires more of your constraints, whether that's a labor constraint or a component or a machine, you can go ahead and prioritize those demands, forecast, or even customer profiles to allow that to, um, to meet those inventory elements sorry, meet those demand elements in the priority that your business expects. Again, a really helpful strategic decision-making tool that allows you to understand, you know, if you run into issues, as, as a lot of our clients are, with labor, for example, and you would love to run three shifts, but you can only find labor for a single shift. Well, what can we do with that? What customers are going to get me can we still meet our primary customers is walmart going to be short you know those are the type of things that that your leadership is asking um, and now you're able to provide those in a scenario-based manner what if we could find a second shift what if we turned on a coat packer what if we enabled you know any any of those levers that you have at your disposal what does that do to your demand signal and having those all side by side really help to uh, make strategic decisions with your eyes wide open I would say these are things that were happening anyway, right? These are just things that were happening offline or ad hoc or in the back of a napkin, right? And so it's not like these requirements or these tasks are even new. It's the fact that there's a tool to support them and takes a lot of that uncertainty out of the mix, takes a lot of that gut feel, tribal knowledge, whatever you want to call it, but presents that facts in, in a way that tells you not just your first level ramifications, for example, can we meet that customer's demand, but second level. So, for example, yeah, we have labor to do this plan, but do we have components to do it, right? Do we have carriers from A to C? We never shipped on that lane before. Those are the type of elements that, that really give you that next level of certainty, um, trying to find a feasible plan um, when you get tight on capacity, components, or labor, or anything else these days. So, so one of the things, Mike, I think I'll kind of just to add on the fair share distribution, it, it's really similar to, you know, in, in what used to be tiering, the tiering kind of calculation that was done in s &P. And so what this allows you to do is kind of, you know, one of the things on the distribution on the tactical side is really the ability to kind of 
prioritize products as opposed to customers. So you're not always giving the same high priority customers and meeting all of your customer demands for specific customers. This allows you to then say, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at things holistically across the the supply chain across all customers and then you know balance that out it's just a little different take on it but allows you to then kind of i would say short everyone consistently if you will um so again like the tiering it looks at the segments which are very similar to what you would have seen in smp back in the day yep. The other thing that allows you to do, and um, Eric mentioned some of the reporting investments that, that SAP made, and this one is probably my favorite <laughs> because it, it was so difficult to do in the past, is to give you not just projections in financial terms, or sorry, operational terms, like units, as we see here on the bottom right screenshot, but also in financial terms, because that's really what matters, right? You move from, uh, those of you that are, are Gartner fans, you move up that supply chain maturity curve with, with this type of functionality. So it's no longer, you know, can it fit, right? Can it fit in this plan? If I added a shift, will it, will it work? But at what cost and is it profitable? And that really moves you from that sort of phase two um, operational to that uh, stage three of maturity curve, which is much more, you know, should we be doing this? Is this a good financial decision to do? If you've got three bad plans, for example, it's really not a great situation. Which one is least costly or most profitable? And it does that. Um, we didn't really mention some of the data functionality, but the way that the IBP application is built on that HANA database allows for a couple of things that are very different in a time series manner than they used to be in S&P. So let's go through those real quick. A couple examples are one, aggregating data is easy. <laughs> that sounds like, well, it should be, and it should be, but it wasn't, right? A lot of times, depending on how uh, supply network planning books were created in S&P and APO, aggregating data would give you um, short jumps. It was a pretty significant power drain um, processing hog on the system and more often than not, if you were trying to do an organizational or a business unit roll up, it would fail because of the way it was calculated. And the other issue is that a lot of times when you did get it to calculate, you'd have to do it with averages. And this was a big issue on, on the demand planning side, but also in supply planning. And so you'd lose a lot of that confidence because you know a couple pennies here and there over a lot of uh, units makes a difference. So what IVP has done is allow you to do a couple things. One, aggregate data very quickly, based on that cloud architecture in the HANA database. And second of all, it allows you to do financialization of that data as well. So by having the price at the most granular level, call it weak customer product level, and doing all of that math at the lowest level and aggregating the sums on that server, the returning value to the user is just that sum. So you can see on the left-hand side, Right away, you can get some pro forma elements. What's my production cost? How much are we spending on labor? What's my raw material cost? And as you create scenarios, those can stack up as well and give you real time um, side by side results from those constrained plans. What if we did A? What if we did, um, what if we did co-packer even though it's more expensive? What if we had a third shift even though it's time and a half? You know, those, those type of elements can be modeled quickly shown up front and then provide you that faster decision-making capability to feed into the execution side of the house. Pretty cool stuff. Very difficult to do, I would say, in prior systems. It's uh, sort of second nature here in IBP. Yeah, and I'd second that, Mike. If you kind of think about the, the capabilities of um, supply, it's really, I mean, the other thing is you can bring your, your revenue plan and compare that against your uh, your supply plan, your costs, right? So you've got your revenue, your costs, and profitability, and you kind of put those all together. Um, again, now you're looking at things holistically, which are uh, you just couldn't have done easily in, in APO uh, prior to this. So it's which is why a lot of those external reporting bit. solutions were yeah, built, right? In, right, exactly. And so to me, this is kind of really the big unlock for IBP um, is the ability to kind of look at this quickly, you know, your financial um, impact of your plan. Uh, quickly and do different different versions and scenarios across the board. So this is really a huge one. And you kind of think about your project going forward as you migrate from S&P to, to IBP. This is an area for, this is, I don't want to call it new because there were some 
some capabilities within um, within EPO. But this is an area that that I think as you look going forward is really you want to spend some focus and time on getting this because it's a lot. It gives you a lot of capabilities within your organization to kind of look at a profitability and a revenue plan. Um, which is just something you couldn't do before. And if you look at your S&P process, et cetera, this really brings a lot more context to the decisions that you're making. Now you're not looking at just a quantity plan, you're looking at a financial plan. You can kind of bring those together and make much better decisions for your organization. So, nice job, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> nice, all right. So coming back to some of the operational supply planning Elements that, that covered time series planning. Again, the takeaway from time series is that the lowest level is time bucket planning. Uh, it's easy to create data, it's easy to model data, and now you're able to do it with financial projections and scenarios side by side with different constraints. Now that you've had that plan, right, then you start to operationalize it. And these elements, I would say, you know, they're not novel tasks, I would say, but the way they're packaged are a lot different than you would have seen them packaged in an APO environment. So as you're moving from one to the other, right, your, your finite capacity is going to give you a couple of different steps here. Your first one is your supply planning and allocation, which is going to give you those supply, or give you that plan based on the supply chain constraints and provide allocations. And that's a key area to, to start giving priorities. If you're doing, you know, you know, the hottest new toy or, you know, micro or, you know, a phone that everybody wants or something like that. Something that seems crazy high demand, right? This prevents you from having customers come in and ordering three times what they've always ordered, right? You can make those strategic decisions ahead of time, put those caps in and allow that to cascade in the order management process. Feeding your customer service strategy through your planning tool. Pretty cool stuff. All right. The other one is on the response planning to allow some of those prioritized demands. So giving you a um, an allocation plan based on those supply chain constraints and actually integrating with the sales order is that um, that priority heuristic that gives you the ability to sort of rack and stack the demands against the available inventory, prioritize those demands, and then yeah, if there's no allocation, for example, go ahead and you know meet all sales orders first even if it's later on in the horizon because all sales orders need to be met. Conversely, you could set it up to say, we're going to meet all of the demand for our number one customer because we have to meet them. So I'm going to hold inventory back for forecast that, you know, customer A1, um, even if it means shorting, you know, some customer we never hear from before. Those are the type of decisions that take a lot of business discussion, I would say and a lot of rationalization around how do we want to actually meet our clients, right? Where, how do we want to meet their demands? What's our strategy? This is where um, I think there can be a lot of um, discussion, we'll say, inside an organization around how are we actually going to operate. Really interesting stuff and actually um, really great so that everybody's pulling in the same direction with that planning. Finally, on your deployment side, it's it's similar. You're going to look for um, basically your, your constrained heuristics, your optimization to give that deployment signals, create that deployment plan, and adjust based on the constraints in your supply chain. You can go through those runs. Can't get it to go to the next one here. There we go. So the allocation flow, again, this is the first step in in the process of your order-based planning it's um, allows for either heuristics or optimization to run and it's going to look at those uh, sourcing rules demand prioritization and costs to give you the best possible option for your supply chain um, this is sort of an interesting concept too in, in your supply proposals and the allocations i'm not sure how many people broadly used allocations or any sort of allocation feature before this but um, I personally did not run across it a lot in an APO environment, not to say others did, that was just my experience. But to have that live order processing, that live allocation functionality, um, as well as the supply, supply proposals integrated, sort of gives you some really powerful weapons to um, do the most with the constraints that you have. We are seeing a lot of people, a lot of clients, 
fifth priority in their investments to do this allocation because they see a constrained environment, they see high labor costs, they see um, you know, an environment where demand doesn't necessarily drive the show, run the show, but it's more about what can we sell. So instead of um, <laughs> make whatever it is that we can sell, it is sell whatever it is that we can make and sort of an interesting flip on the equation, but that's where this engine comes in a lot. Moving into the response planning flow here, Again, looking for more of the um, demand prioritization, looking for some of those heuristics. Again, this is much more um, that rack and stack functionality so that if you have certain customers, different needs, um, certain demand types, certain time horizons that require uh, more focus than others, that's what this response engine will drive and allowing you to get a lot of those sales order confirmation supply proposals to back up or to actually enable execution of that customer facing strategy. Any comments on how this is going to change Eric in the future you mentioned that it would you'd be combining some of these um, in future yeah. stuff. Yeah, I don't have a slide on that yet. I'm going to have to redo it at the beginning of next year in 2022. Um, but the intent is to have instead of three runs Combining the the run that you're showing here and the one you just showed, we call them the constrained forecast run and the confirmation run. Um, combining those into one template, and then inside of that template, you can determine whether you want to do forecast consumption, whether you want to take into consideration individual sales orders, whether you want to do uh, allocations as an output. Do you want to consume the allocations? Do you want to do confirmations? Yes or no. So there'll be switch buttons. You could still do the same thing, which is running. A, and running a, a run to create the allocations as template number one, and then you could do that same, take that same template and modify it, and then run it uh, to do consumption of the allocations you create it. If you go to the next slide there for a second, that is the data. Oops, sorry, where is? Oh no, sorry, I was on the wrong one. Right there at the bottom right hand corner. Yes, yeah, is optionally used during the confirmation runs. So in one template run, you could say create the allocations. Now go to the next slide if you would. And then you see the left-hand side there, the little box in the gray, allocations optionally consumed from that run. So you could rerun it to consume the allocation. So you can do the same thing. Today, they're fixed three different runs. In the future, you're gonna have the first and second runs combined where you have the switches to tell it what you want it to do. So we're simplifying it, basically. Thank you. Um, one question we had pop up is, is any of this exclusive to S4 or can it run with ECC? Um, um, this is independent, right. yeah, independent of the ERP system. Yep. yep. So either one, and that's a key element here. We do get that concern a lot. People don't think they can run this if they're not on S4. That is not true. You can run it with ECC or S4. Or a non-SAP backend. <laughs> I didn't even know those existed, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, we have to integrate to one. It's not often. <laughs> um. All right, so with this one, um, <coughs> excuse me, oh, I drank water in the wrong pipe. So the reconfirmation of the sales order as changes occur, so, you know, what sort of horizons are we talking at here? Is this much more of the, it looks like the short to midterm horizon. Generally, we're seeing this in a much more, um, I don't wanna say reactionary, but basically it is, right? As life changes, as sales orders come in, as inventory positions change, um, you know, you may need to react more quickly as as the assumptions change from underneath you, right? So being able to reschedule the sales orders and reconfirm based on the constraints that are modeled, um, based on, you know, life that happens, I guess. I hate to be that dramatic about it, but, you know, if a, if a production line goes down, for example, or if a batch of raw materials show a, a quality problem, these are the types of, um, reconfirmations that need to occur to adapt and these are very short term i'd call it within the week guys is that fair enough sort of reschedule these activities so as you're thinking about some of these supply planning functionalities you know they get closer and closer into the near term and that that funnel allows for much tighter integration 
which means that these are a real-time integrated solution, near real-time, Eric, is that what you say? Um, with your ERP solution, so that as the changes occur on this order-based planning side, for example, your raw materials change, that comes in, um, your production, you can rerun those production plans, rerun your sales order prioritization, and then reintegrate that back. You're not talking about days of, um, you know, you're not talking about having to take it offline because it takes two days for the overnight runs to work. You're talking about near real-time integration that you can do this uh, fairly quickly. Any comments on this one, guys? Moving on. I, sorry, I was on mute. Um, again, what I mentioned earlier, the whole thing, if someone, you know, held my feet to the fire and said, tell me what, you know, response and supply is, if it could be one piece of functionality is what you just showed, which is the reconfirmation of sales orders. It of course can do more than that, but this is um, just the unique ability that we've brought to IVP that we did not have in APO. Yeah, I mean, it would just be kind of reshuffling the whole deck manually, right, in the past? Yeah, yeah. Again, my analogy using old school <laughs> terminology was a CTM run on one hand and a BOP run on the other. Right, and that's they're now combined. And sometimes when we did it historically, and it's okay to still do it, but sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, right? And you could do a perfect supply run in CTM, and then Bob could go reshuffle the deck, like you said, and just change it based upon its own rules. We're mm -hmm. bringing those rules and the supply creation and the changing of that demand element, the sales order, all together in one run. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing in MVP. Pretty cool stuff. All right. Um, moving on into your deployment process here. I would call this some of the, um, you'll see some greatest hits from those of you that have had experience with APO deployment and you're available to deploy <laughs> acronyms. But basically, you're looking for constraints, right? So if you're trying to run that um, rules based heuristic or your optimization, what do you really need? You need to know where are the demands? Where's the inventory? And then you start to understand, well, based on the production orders, the stock transfers, the sales orders that are coming in, where does inventory need to move from A to B? You'll run that deployment engine and produce those stock transfer requisitions or sales order confirmations and, and see the pegging behind that. So you'll understand if things are late, if they're delayed, why are they delayed? Well, it's because the lead times don't uh, allow for it or there's not uh, you know the production is shifted to next week because of you know who knows raw because of a uh, equipment maintenance issue all those things can help you and um, understand it and you can see the tiny screens down there but it really does help you with those traffic lights green yellow red coding as well as some really intuitive pegging functionality allows you to understand why things are moving where they're moving what this does, and I've always kind of had this as a tenant in my projects, is that the better the better you see a deployment process run, it's an indicator of really good master data health. Because for somebody to actually execute a deployment plan as it's generated means that you have to have a lot of things right upstream. You have to have demands correct. You have to have lead times correct. You have to have production scheduling correct. You have to have inventory availability correct. And your receiving times need to be correct. So all of those elements sort of show up in an executable deployment process, which is where you see all these um, inputs appear here. Um, moving on. Any questions here, comments on deployment as we're getting to the last 30 minutes? Now, the only thing that I would add is um, sometimes people look at this. Um, as it stands today, we have the 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 heuristic is the priority based. So this is different than the other heuristic that we had in APO SMP for two main things. One, it's only pull based. It's not where we used to have the pull push settings, right? If there was overages, we could push and fair share by quota, whatever that. That's something that's coming in the future. We actually did release a kind of a, a push logic um, last release, I think in, in August or may have been in May. Um, but it pushes based upon priority only. And if you would like to learn more about that, it's on the help documentation or there was part of the what's new. Um, it does not push based upon quotas yet. That's something that's on the roadmap. That's the first thing. Second though is, you mentioned this, Mike, I'd just like to reiterate it said slightly different way. We have pegging here. 
in the days before an APO deployment, it only looked kind of one level at a time, right? It'd say, I'm a plant. Oh, I have all these demands on me. I don't know what's really driving them. I have to, I have to distribute based upon whatever logic and the settings you told me. Well, this using the heuristic is looking out into the future at the demand element, the finished good, the sales order, the safety stock. And with that being said, you can prioritize them. So you now have the ability to say, I want to distribute my deployment run based on all sales orders first. Then I'm going to do then I'm going to do forecasts as an example. Whereas before the deployment logic, it didn't know whether it was a forecast, a safety stock, a shortage, sales order, didn't know. It just knew it owed it, right? So that's different. We have pegging in here. So they're the two big things in my mind that stand out. The optimization is pretty much the same as we had before. So thank you. All right. So moving on to this one, right? In, if you're trying to sort of have your cheat sheet of what these order-based planning algorithms do, um, and and basically what they're what they're what, sorry, what they're saying. What do they do, right? So your supply and allocation that constrained forecast run. This is the one Eric um, referred to as actually adjusting some of the demand calculations. So understanding. My forecast is X. Once we run it through the constraints, it shows what that constrained forecast can run. So you can have supply creation within constraints and allowing you to, to, um, to sort of project a constrained forecast based on the constraints in your system. This doesn't actually get into the sales order confirmation yet, but it will give you some of the allocation creation and it will actually do that constrained planning run, creating your planned orders and stock transfers. Your confirmation run is going to do that sales order confirmation. So again, now you're going to look for forecast consumption. You're going to run that um, supply plan against the constrained forecast run and con confirm those sales order elements. So if you look at the two boxes on the right for the big differences, does that actually do a sales order confirmation, yes or no? And does it create allocations or consumption? So if you think about it, you're really creating the constrained plan on the top and then bouncing that against your sales orders for the confirmation process in that response planning. I'm way oversimplifying, but that's how it works for me. And finally, you're using the uh, deployment planning run to actually do some of that. You're um, creating stock transfers and uh, forecast consumption there. So your data visibility, again, this is something I think is underrated here in the overall operational planning, um, operational pl supply planning suite, you have the Excel-based time series planning. No, it's not time series, but just like time series, you have your Excel-based planning engines at the top left, but you have also these web-based planning views. So you have your web-based view, which is um, the ability to share and disseminate data very quickly without the Excel add-in. You can just have somebody pull it up. You also have order level data at the bottom, which is really helpful. Then you have gating factors and order networks, which show you why things are what they are. Why did we short? Basically some sort of, it's a root cause investigation tool. You can do demand prioritization to understand why demands are ranked. You can look through your supply usage to understand where your inventory is going, where your planned order is going, and then understand your projected stock. And you can see it, just a little tiny version here, but those traffic lights I think are really advantageous to help people understand um, and quickly prioritize at a glance. Really powerful tools with a variety of different elements. Um, instead of using the GUI as, as a lot of people are used to, planners tend to really quickly uh, get up to speed on these implementations because they're using platforms they're familiar with. They're using Excel, they're using the web, they're using intuitive um, buttons, colors, alerts, um, you know, to do all these activities in the tool that they're, they live in every day in the internet and, and Excel. So really, really quick user adoption, something I think is, is underrated. So now we're gonna move into the best practices for these projects. This is something that, um, you know, I think people need to consider things that you need to review if you haven't done these projects before, which I'm guessing most of you haven't, but the first one, and I think this is the most important one, if you don't, if you take any of these tips away from project implementations, it is that your process map is critical. 
Um, this is this is easy to think of an upgrade to an APO platform, but this supply side specifically is anything but. So if you're going into it thinking, I'm just going to move S&P directly over into IBP, your project is really going to struggle because there's not a one-for-one -one map. And that's not, and I think there's an advantage to having that. You, like I mentioned before, each planning area, each set of functionality has features that are, um, technology features that allow it to do what it's meant to do better. It's not a one size fits all tool. However, to leverage that, you really need to understand your own processes and map those to where they go. So we talked about a couple of things, right? We talked about your SNOP process. We talked about evaluating labor plans. We talked about, um, you know, updating financial assumptions based on pricing or promotions or you know projected shortfalls that's all great that all works in time series planning where we see people struggle the most is when they try to make a tool do something it's not meant to do for example technically speaking could you run planning every day in time series and, and export to your erp system from a technological point of view sure it really struggles to do that. I would say it's really not recommended and it's going to be full of compromises, um, which will prevent you from getting the results that you expect from your implementation. And we see people do that when they try and lift and shift your S&P directly into a time series planning, right? It's easy to get there. I'm not blaming anybody for that assumption. Time series planning looks like a grid with numbers, S&P looks like a grid with numbers, great, we're gonna move it over. But there's a lot of nuances in that ex running execution level planning, having execution level expectations in a time series planning area that make it extremely difficult to do. That's my big warning. Don't go in there assuming you can do it. Time series planning should be bucketed. You should be looking at not order level granularity. You should be looking at monthly planning activities call it six weeks plus in your planning horizon budgeting snop network projections inventory projections right those are the type of risk mitigations from that tactical or strategic level that's your time series planning when you're mapping that of course at some point you need to get to a more granular level which is your order series of execution don't make your order series be tactical don't make your tactical be order based right you want to have these um Feature sets play to their strengths, don't make them do something different. So when you say, well, what's gonna feed my scheduling tool, right? How am I gonna get allocations? What's gonna integrate on a daily basis? How often do I need to um, understand my inventory evaluation? That's really where order series exists. So you wanna understand what tasks are we doing, even if they're offline today, and then mapping them to one of these or the other, right? You wanna make sure that these are feasible, that there are handoffs understood, and that the process map aligns to your implementation plan. This one I cannot overstate enough, understanding your own process map. And when I say that, again, it's not just what you're doing in APO, it's all the offline stuff you're doing. Um, go in there and ask for people's offline spreadsheets. What are they doing on their desktop? What are they emailing back and forth? Bring all those processes to light and then put them where they best fit in the IBP solution set. That's a best practice for sure. Um, Pat or Eric, any any other, <laughs> this is pretty uh, hard, but any other words of warning? I was just gonna kind of reiterate that. There's so many things that happen that, you know, we'll get into projects and we'll hear, well, we're doing this offline or it happens here, it's part of our process. And then it kind of bubbles up after the fact that it's not, that's it, it's something outside the scope of what's in the system and then you have a gap of what's happening in excel a gap that is being filled by an excel spreadsheet somewhere um that then kind of says well i don't trust the system anymore because i have my excel spreadsheet and getting one source of truth one source of data you know getting the the information to be able to plan in the system is kind of key Understanding that the reason that the Excel, and like Mike always says, the reason that the Excel spreadsheets come along is because there's a gap in either the process or in the system that needs to be filled, right? So there's some information or um, a, a calculation that's not being not being made. Um, that's true most of the time, right? And, and it's true most of the time that 
that that can be filled by the system. So um, rarely <laughs> something that, that's not available for uh, not available for use within SAP, but kind of understanding what your process is, making sure that if you do have gaps or just something you're doing offline, mapping it to a best practice, something within, um, you know, whether it's an IBP or a, a, another tool within uh, S4 or PPDS, et cetera, but making sure you understand to get into the right home is really kind of key to success. All right. Sorry, my soapbox. <laughs> What's that? My soapbox is done. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get back up on it. So, from the integration point of view, that's another one. Um, understanding the need for integration and the timing of integration is also something that people don't spend enough time on, in my point of view. Um, there's a there's a there's two sort of pitfalls on the time series planning side. And, and one of them is I need to integrate everything all the time, every day, five times a day, right? Because that's what I used to do in S&P. And I would say that is a recipe for chaos in your time series planning architecture. If you understand that that time series plan is meant to drive a uh, strategic tactical process and monthly cadence, Right? There's no need to integrate things every day. All you're doing is changing the foundation out from under your planners. What really matters, right? what, what really moves the needle in, is that all of those data elements need to be in sync with each other. They need to be from roughly the same time stamp and they need to be coming in at roughly that same time. So for example, if you have forecast that was meant by a sales order, right? that um, sales order consumes a forecast, now that sales order um, is going to reduce inventory in the future. Well, once it's shipped, that inventory has been reduced. If you're if you're uh, integrating inventory once a week in sales orders every day, you're now going to uh, under plan your needs. So it's going to look like you have plenty of inventory, but that inventory has already been shipped out the door. You want everything to be synced up, imported at the same time, and that's much more important than the frequency. Now, as long as you're working off the same set of assumptions, you can do a lot more with it. If you're having to sort of back in and recalculate things because of offsetting integration schedules, that's gonna cause issues in your time series. Again, understanding where that um, comes from doesn't just go to your ERP system, but if you have uh, different non-SAP systems, if you have CRM tools, if you have other application data, making sure that they're at least uh, in the realm of in the same time is going to eliminate a lot of confusion and, and will eliminate workarounds in your time series planning. Order series integration, I sort of alluded to it in the deployment discussion, but understanding that it is execution level planning that you're doing means that you need execution level rigor in that data. If you want to do, um, for example, some of those deployment um, functionalities, or even understanding some of the allocation logic, right? Understanding where those constraints cause issues. If your lead times are off, right? That's gonna ripple through and cause a whole bunch of unintended side effects. Because if, you're, um, if your lead times are all two weeks, but it really takes four weeks, right? Now that's gonna cause people to go outside the system. They're not going to trust the plan that comes out. And those algorithms require accurate data to make those timely decisions. If that part is going to be here two weeks from today, it needs to be here two weeks from today for that to work. Otherwise, you're going to prioritize different customers, you're going to assume inventory is there when it's not, and you're going to ship the wrong things at the wrong time. So that bi-level, bi-directional level of data integration is great, but it requires um, a level of data confidence that I think people also underestimate. It allows you to do things faster, and that includes making mistakes. So the other one is data integrity for, for multiple tasks. So this is sort of an, an awkward title, but what it's really meant to be is showing that in time series, sort of expand your um, understanding of what a capacity model is. Capacity is whatever makes you change your decision-making process in your supply planning activities. So 
if you need to plan labor, if you need to plan shared labor, if you have a shared machine, if you have anything that needs to be accounted for, right, that, that will cause you to make a change in your supply planning network or your supply planning uh, strategy, right, that needs to be modeled and brought in. Otherwise, it's going to just cause you issues and you end up undoing it. So we've seen people do shared labor resources, and that doesn't necessarily need to be modeled in your ERP system to be in your time series plan. Um, storage resources is another one. It's not going to do down to like bin level scheduling, but if you want to know will it fit or will it not fit, you should be able to plan that and at least if not plan it, evaluate it. And I think people sometimes get too literal in, in their evaluation that if that master data element doesn't exist in ERP, then it can't be planned in time series. Um, with IBP, you need to sort of take that assumption off the table because you can create data elements where it matters in IBP alone or on a what-if basis, whether that be a temp skew for, for future product lines which aren't defined yet or constraints which aren't necessarily one-for-one um, -one with an ERP data element. Sort of coming back to what are we trying to plan against, what are we making decisions on, and putting that in time series is something people don't just think about. Um, but they need to, right? They need to understand um, uh, that is a uh, capability that brings a lot of these offline spreadsheets back into the system, back into that one source of the truth. Uh, I mentioned the order series data integrity. Again, you need to cleanse that data and be rigorous on it. So it's not just cleansing for day one of the project, but how do we ensure that it stays cleansed and that it stays um, in a state of good repair, I guess is the way to say it throughout the project, because having that master data management process um, is critical for ongoing success and trusting of the tool. So it's kind of a weird uh, slide in that the time series is saying you can kind of branch out a bit more from the literal master data you have in your ERP system. You can add constraints or create shared constraints there. In order series, you really want to make sure that you have a process in place to be able to trust those algorithms as they run, that they have the latest up-to-date data. Um, so with that, right, let's talk a little bit about how we've, how we've walked through this. Now, Pat, do you want to sort of walk through this um, rapid-fire methodology to help with these transitions? No, and just to kind of talk through it, what we do is, that, you know, one of the offerings that we have is that we have, we call it rapid-fire uh, uh, project methodology, but we try to do is take the system architecture design and best practices, which is, is kind of the first thing we do, and kind of you go through your journey from S&P to IBP, we try to you know, because we're, we're long-term practitioners of APO or s &P, and we try to map, right, things that we've done in the past, living off the, the um, I would say, the learning from our mistakes over time, some of the best practices is we start saying, what is being accomplished in s &P? What are you doing? And, you know, how are you uh, planning in your legacy environments, which includes s &P and potentially other uh, software systems, and then kind of mapping that to how we're going to use that within IBP. So specifically, we've created uh, configuration uh, templates and kind of those to jumpstart your project to say these are the key considerations for what you're doing in SMP. Are you doing deployment? Are you doing uh, you know uh, CTM uh, optimization? Blah blah blah. All of the things, the capabilities within SMP, and then start mapping those as an architectural uh, high-level perspective into how you would accomplish that within. IDPs, taking it from APO uh, SP and then uh, taking your design templates and then moving that into IBP. So now you can kind of take a high level look and start pushing, putting the pieces together and where it belongs. One of the things that we find, again, like Mike was saying before, you know, SP or you want to do all of your capabilities within time series. Well, you know, that's probably not the case. You know, some of the functions belong within. Um, within time series uh, uh, in response and supply within IBP and some of the functions belong within response which is your order based uh, uh, process and then to be quite honest some of the, some of the applications and execution and, and functions that you're doing and probably belong within PPDS because you're doing it within SMP because you don't have that capability so one of the things we try to do is kind of take a back take a step back and then help you sketch that out and kind of get the functions within the right capabilities. And really, if you kind of look at the bottom there, that's SNOP best practices, 
within uh, IBP response and supply. So we kind of take a big, a high level picture. Okay. And then the other thing we do is kind of at a lower level, uh, we built out templates and um, kind of our best practices about looking at APO master data, looking at your aggregates within, if you have any, and mapping those to, to IBP master data, looking at your, your APO SP key figures and macros, if you have anything that you've custom configured and developments, et cetera, mapping those to IBP key figures and calculations within supply. And again, whether that's response, right? Response and supply, order series or time series based on based on the function that uh, um, S&P is using. Again, planning level mapping, right? So some of those things are looking at aggregations. And then the other thing would be optimization. We spent a lot of time uh, and we've got a lot of experience in the optimization realm of s &P. and so that's one area where we've, we've got some deep expertise in mapping the cost um, as well as kind of the objective function within the s &P optimizer and mapping that to how you would solve that problem within within IBP and again we do the same thing for s and IBP response so not only the time series side but the, the response which would be order series um, again planning algorithm mapping making sure that you're doing the right uh, you know, based on experience, making sure you're mapping at a high level, mapping the right pieces of master data, as well as the algorithms to the specific from S and P and mapping that to the to the right functions within IBP. Mm -hmm. And then again, we have all, you know, based on best practices and things we've learned over the years, uh, planning views and templates and, and kind of looking at all of your uh, aggregations and defining master data in a specific way to help you through that and, you know, making sure that we all have those that have that we've used over the years that have kind of been very specific to not only industries but um, processes that we we've, we've used in the past that have been effective. Okay. Yeah, so I think that one becomes even more critical, right, with the supply planning one, because mm -hmm. it does take a bit more thought to um, to map activities, whether and I think. The biggest struggle is activities, I said, not not functional scope, we're not requirements, but activities. What are your people doing? Mapping them to the new system. What's coming in? What's coming out? Where is it moving? Supply planning is the most uh, has the most moving parts, and this is where it comes into play. It's a lot more valuable. So with that, we've reached the end, I think, of our of our session. 90 minutes is a long time. I'm going to leave it with this uh, response and supply roadmap just to show that the solution is not done, right? This is how it exists today. SAP continues to pour resources in it, continues to add to it. Um, do you have a top three things on this list, Eric, that um, you wanna highlight from everybody? Your three favorites? It's, it's, it's hard to boil down to three, but I'll try. <laughs> um, there's like 45 bullet points. If you give me five, I'll, I could do better. But, um, no, I, would, I, would, I would say real-time integration. You can see it there across the top, the initial release, the first bullet point happening in November of this year and then continuing through next year. Um, this is important. It gets us back to the SIF, which is great when you're dealing with operational shorter term planning. Um, number two probably would be the question I could ask the most about is you can see it in the middle there of 2022 load consolidation under distribution planning header. Um, so that's the equivalent, our new generic term for TLB, for those of you familiar with that. Um, I won't go into gory detail here. We'll have a, a broader topic, at least from an SAP perspective, as part of the enablement sessions next year when this plans come. But we have a two-pronged approach here. I'll just give you a little teaser. Part one is like TLB, what we, we're considering self-contained within IBP. Um, and then part two for more um, deeper requirements is a service call to TM where they have much broader functionality than we have basic stuff. They have like pallet stacking and axle loading and front loading and all kinds of hazardous material. Can't A can't be with B. So a lot of our customers have those detailed requirements, which TLB could never handle. So they either highly customize it in APO or they did something on the side. So since IBP is a cloud solution, we don't want to build this thing out to redo some TM. Um, so we want to do a, a more simplified approach initially next year, and then likely the following year will be the connection to TM for the advanced um, um, needs and requirements. So that's number two. Uh, and then number three, if I only going to get the top three, 
uh, would be if you go down the bottom there, the initial use cases for characteristics-based planning. It's under the process integration in 2022. Third bullet point from the bottom right there, yep. Um, CBP is a big umbrella, right? Which um, the three main use cases we're gonna focus on is shelf life, is um, validation uh, for like life sciences. So that's regulatory stuff like country of origin, something like this, or can only be made on a certain resource. Um, and then third what is um, around what we call attribute-based planning. So um, this is important because this is, ties into the uh, apparel industry. So there's the top ones. And I should say the focus for 2022 is going to be on shelf life planning with batches and pegging and et cetera. So keep an eye out on that for next year. And I need to turn off my video before my PC dies. <laughs> Hopefully, you. Uh, hopefully, my audio came through at least. <laughs> yeah, it did. Hear. Then, Mike, are you still with us? There you go. I'm back. The uh, my laptop died, so I had to run and get my power cord. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. I was saying the same thing as you were getting it. I'm gonna go plug mine in right now. <laughs> We must have the we same. Must, we must have been in the same schedule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, for that interruption, Eric, I'll give you one more. Okay. So then, I guess for yeah, I guess for number for number four would probably be around. The, it comes in waves as VMI listed right underneath load consolidation. This one I get asked about a lot. Uh, either get never get asked about it for six months, and then I'll have four or five questions within a week. Um, it matters to those that care about it, and it doesn't matter to those that don't care. Um, but <clears throat> VMI is huge in the CP industry, of course, and um, this is some functionality we had both in APO and SNC historically, and the intent here is to do the planning aspect of it inside of IBP, creation of the sales order, the connectivity back to ERP, um, <clears throat> then the creation of the element for the um, for the purchase order in the in the customer system. So just like the same process we had historically. But some people have thought, well, SNC is now the Ariba supply chain collaboration. Will it be done there? And the short answer to that is our objective is no. The objective is to do it inside of IBP. So think of it in the days of SMP where we had the capability to do that whole process tie with ERP. That's what we're, we intend to replicate here as well. Nice, thank you. So with that, thank you everybody for hanging in there for 90 minutes. This is a big topic. It could be a whole day. Uh, hopefully it won't be, but we will. We do appreciate everybody hanging in there. We are gonna post this as um, to our YouTube channel. So check that out, check out our website and email us with any questions you might have along the way. Appreciate everybody's time, attention today. Um, and join us next time for JTP and PPDS in two weeks. Uh, everybody have a great rest of your week. And thanks for giving us Party Monday. Bye. Thanks, thanks everyone.